Good evening, everyone. My name is Ware Harmon. I'm the Executive Director of Town Hall Seattle on behalf of our organization and our friends at Third Place Books. It's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's virtual presentation of Brad Stone in conversation with Karen Wise. It's part of our civic series. And as we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And we thank you all for joining us here on our new streaming platform, myths.org. Like everything at Town Hall, it is absolutely a work in progress. So please don't hesitate to tell us about your experience at the address that you'll find in the chat below the, the viewer. Uh, tonight's conversation will be around 60 minutes, including Q&A with the audience. Questions will be selected from those in the chat field at the bottom. So submit yours at any time. You can also text your questions to the number 206-504-2857. That number is also in the chat. We can't guarantee we'll get to every question. We'll try to get to as many as possible. And for those who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Town Hall's adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include authors Tom McGuain and Sebastian Younger, Social Venture Partners founder Paul Shoemaker in conversation with former Seahawks uh, receiver Doug Baldwin, Annette Gordon-Reed on the history of Juneteenth, the 100th edition of our podcast, In the Moment, celebrating co-hosts Ginny Palmer and Steve Scher and their endurance achievement, and the latest installment in our series of live concerts from Town Hall, co-produced with Earshot Jazz, continuing this weekend with the extraordinary trumpeter Thomas Marriott. You can check out more of what's upcoming by visiting our online calendar at townhallseattle.org. Town Hall's programs are made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors, our civics series, is supported by the Real Networks Foundation, the True Brown Foundation, KUOW, the Northcliffe Foundation, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know, Town Hall is underneath it all, a member supported organization. I wanna thank all of our members watching this evening. One last note, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Brad's book, and I feel certain you will be, please use the link in the chat below to buy through our partner bookseller, Third Place Books. We know you'll have other options, let's say, to purchase your books, perhaps from other online sources, but you know, given everything, third place is a good option. The button's right there. And uh, that way we can ensure that everything we love about this community from before the pandemic um, will still be around to delight us on the other side. And with all of that, Brad Stone is the senior, a senior executive editor of global technology at Bloomberg News, where he oversees a team of over 60 reporters and editors covering high-tech companies, startups, cybersecurity, and internet trends around the world. Stone was previously a San Francisco-based correspondent for the New York Times and for Newsweek. He's the author of the 2013 New York Times bestseller, The Everything Store, Jeff Bezos and the Age of Amazon, which has been translated into over 35 languages, as well as 2017's The Upstarts, Uber, Airbnb, and the battle for the new Silicon Valley. Karen Wise is a technology correspondent for the New York Times. She's currently based in Seattle, where she covers Amazon, Microsoft, and the region's tech scene generally. Before joining the Times in 2018, she worked for Bloomberg Businessweek and Bloomberg News, as well as the nonprofit investigative newsroom ProPublica. Brad Stone's book, Amazon Unbound, Jeff Bezos and the Invention of a Global Empire, is the subject of the discussion tonight on Town Hall's virtual stage. And I hope we'll be able to host Brad again sometime on our physical one. But for now, please join me in welcoming Karen Wise and Brad Stone. Thank you. Thanks. So Brad, I was thinking about where to start, and I thought I would start where I start reading the book, <laughs> chapter 13, <laughs> not the beginning, <laughs> which um, is sort of one of this, this crazy moment two years ago um, when Jeff Bezos's public life exploded kind of into the tabloid world. I got the book and literally that night, I tore through that chapter and texted you and said I audibly gasped at one point. Um, this was kind of a, if this is the Jeff of today, what did you learn? What happened in this episode? And what did you learn that kind of wasn't obvious at the time as, as this kind of one of the most public moments in this career you've been chronicling for so many years? Right, right. well, first of all, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Weir and, and everyone at Town Hall. Um, let me start with a little bit of background, uh, Karen. Um, I started working on this book in 2017. I just had the notion that uh, the company I had written about in the Everything Store was sort of a historic relic and so much had happened. Alexa, um, you know, India, Jeff's rise to become one of the wealthiest people in the world. And, and I needed to do a sequel. And, and so I'm working on it in 2017 and 2018. And then early 2019, 
when uh, you know the tweet heard around the world about the uh, the Bezos divorce. And you know, I, you're covering Amazon for the New York Times. I'm writing a, this book about Amazon and covering it for Bloomberg. I don't know about you, but my jaw hit the floor sort of audibly. Um, and if if you if folks remember, um, there was sort of a little bit of ambiguity at the end of it. You know what what happened. Um, Bezos wrote a, a famous Medium post accusing the National Enquirer of extorting him, raising the possibility that there were political motives, that maybe it was the Trump administration getting back at him for the Washington Post or the government of Saudi Arabia. Um, he said that that was still to be better understood. And he said that owning the post was a complexifier for him. So yeah, Karen, to answer the question, I mean, what I what I learned, and it was a hall of mirrors of complexity and, and you know, folks with agendas and, um, and but ultimately uh, a legal process because the FBI in the Southern District of New York looked at it. And what I conclude, and you know, I'm, I'm sort of open to the possibility that one day we'll find out there, there was another level of conspiracy to it. But what I found out that was, was something that was sort of suspected, which was that Lauren Sanchez's brother, you know, Michael Sanchez had, had uh, delivered the goods, so to speak, to the National Enquirer, had deceived them in one respect, hadn't give, given them any explicit photographs. I think that's where you gasped. Absolutely. <laughs> I, this is a family uh, you know, conference hall here, so I don't know how explicit we can get. I'll follow your lead on that. Um, <laughs> but you know, what was sort of masterful was how he turned the tables on the Enquirer. Um, you know, the editor of the Enquirer got fired basically after that episode. Um, we can sort of get into why that is. And Bezos won, right? That was the cover of Business Week on my ex excerpts. Bezos wins. He he sort of masterfully played it, you know, maybe somewhat disingenuously because it really had nothing to do with the Washington Post or a political hit job. It was it was purely a tabloid story, uh, a wealthy business person who was conducting a relationship that, um, you know, the this newspaper thought its readers would be interested in. That, that was the moment. Every time I had to write the phrase below the belt selfie in the newspaper of record, I was like, how is this real life? Right. And I think a lot of people who knew Jeff wondered the same. And this isn't the Jeff I know, I'm sure is a phrase you heard, you know, right. as someone who values judgment, who is, you know, thinks ahead sort of thing. And there was this kind of masterful spin. It's kind of cynical though, you know, um, he, the, what you described, essentially, he, he kind of harnessed the death of a columnist at the Washington Post to distract from his own, and if, whether or not you consider the fair failure, getting exposed as he did is clearly a failure. And let me add to that. Um, and first, we're, you know, it's, it's, it's just like a challenge of how specific here to be, um, but we, we're, we're probably sort of confusing some people. So one of the things we're talking about is, is Michael Sanchez promised the National Enquirer an explicit photograph, but instead of delivering it, I reported in this book for the first time that he took a, a, an anonymous photo from the, we, from the website, from an escort website and delivered it to the Enquirer. So the Enquirer thought it had the goods and it really didn't. And it's possible that the Bezos camp thought the Enquirer had the goods, even though they didn't. And then the sort of second thing that we're, we're talking about is, um, you know, was Bezos and, and his representatives, were they really disingenuous about feeling like there were political motives to the Enquirer's story? And I actually think, Karen, that, that maybe the jury is out. Like there were reasons for them to suspect in this bizarre episode that maybe this was Trump related. I mean, it's a relic of the Trump administration and how easily we've all wiped it clear from our memories. But, you know, they were doing political stuff and Amazon arguably lost the Jedi contract because Trump hated the Washington Post. I think that's, you know, somewhat evident at this point. Um, the other aspect to it, it's just a bizarre scenario all, all around is that Michael Sanchez, uh, Lauren Sanchez's brother, Jeff, who's Jeff Bezos's partner, is himself a Trump conservative, or at least plays one very credibly on Twitter, and and was bragging to to Bezos's representatives about his affiliation with Trump world characters like Roger Stone, and so it was somewhat plot. Oh, and then sorry, one other aspect: the Saudis were upset at the Washington Post and upset at its dogged pursuit of the Khashoggi murder, and so it might have been sort of plausible that. Uh, 
you know, that there this was a political conspiracy, even though it turned out to be. Um, but I'll say that at the very least, it was convenient, right? It was convenient to weave this international conspiracy when really he had been surprisingly careless to go to your point about, you know, his typical discipline in conducting the relationship, not realizing or perhaps not caring that, you know, he is now of the stature that people were going to be interested in it. And you and I, you know, journalists who treasure our journalistic integrity, we're somehow going to have to be writing about this stuff, which, okay, I'm being a little disingenuous here. It was sort of entertaining. Yeah. It's a good story. And, <laughs> and, and it's a great chapter in the book. And I'm, I take a little bit of pride when you say you turned right to it, even though, you know, I sort of wish you had started and read, you know. Well, through. I was going to say, you scolded me, not scolded me, you said, no, you got to start at the beginning, which yeah. is a fair point. So let's jump backwards then. If this is this moment that is kind of this true Jeff of the, the now era, you know, full control of his and confidence in his power and wealth, not that he was lacking in confidence and power and wealth in the past, but you start your book in about 2011 of Jeff as the product manager. So who was he then and what was Amazon then and how 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 let's kind of let's start this journey essentially right and and that's where I end the everything store right it is the company is ascendant it's you know market cap maybe eighty billion it has invented the Kindle it has struck fear in the hearts of the book publishing industry and it's invented this this thing this promising but little thing called Amazon Web Services and and Amazon Unbound starts there and Jeff has an idea. Uh, he's looking for ways to exploit Amazon's advantage in the cloud. And, and the cloud, AWS, is really a business or an enterprise service. But he's wondering what the consumer applications might be. And at the time, he is uh, having lunch with his technical assistant or TA at the time, a guy named Greg Hart. And Hart shows him voice search on his Android phone. And Bezos, who's a big science fiction fan, uh, has the insight that you know maybe voice search is ready. He puts it all together. He emails his executives, we should build a $20 computer whose voice is in the cloud that's completely controllable by your voice. And that is the email and the inception of the device now known as the Echo or, or Alexa. And he, he manages the heck out of it. He authorizes extraordinary investments in this project. They take it, I have in the chapter, they take it on the, on the road in secret because they need to collect data to make it useful. And they're hiding it in apartments and having contractors come and talk to it and recite scripts. And they're basically surreptitiously gathering data. Um, I, I reveal in the book who the voice of Alexa is uh, and a, a voice actress named Nina Raleigh. Um, I have to remember it rhymes with trolley because I've been mispronouncing it. Um, and, you know, Jeff selected the voice. Um, you know, he authorized the Super Bowl ads. And that was sort of Bezos, maybe even at the height of his inventive powers, at his close management, some might say micromanagement of a team and a product inside Amazon that really did end up being quite impactful culturally, reputation wise for Amazon, probably economically, maybe not in the way that they had hoped, because let's face it, these things are still kind of frustrating. I argue with my Alexa all the time and it's chirping up at inopportune moments. But it, it's, it's a bit of a game changer for Amazon. You also found some of his instincts that people had to go chase were less on point. It's kind of an interesting thing. You're, you, you, just because you get something right doesn't mean you get everything right. Yeah, the Fire Phone being the explicit example. And the cow situation? The, <laughs> the single cow burger. I'll quickly tell that story. Um, he, Bezos reads an article in the Washington Post in 2015 that says a, a, a hamburger might be made from the meat of up to 100 cows. And at the time, um, he is looking for ways to distinguish Amazon Fresh, the grocery service. And so he authorizes the creation of a single cow burger. And, the, and executives can't believe it. They're like, well, this is a joke, right? And he said, no, I'm serious. How hard can this be? Which, frankly, are words that you probably never want to hear from your boss, let alone Jeff Bezos. And so they go, the poor product manager who I, who I had to find um, goes and, and you know, sources the single cow burger, presents it to the, the CEO, um, and he, he samples it and complains that it's too fatty and the packaging is, uh, is hard to open and they have to redo it. And it's a great, it's just a great example of, well, a couple of things. Yeah, how, how in the weeds he can get, 
how he prioritizes new things at Amazon, and perhaps how, as he has become wealthier, his tastes have maybe somewhat diverged from the taste of the common man. I don't know about you, Karen. I mean, I, I actually didn't, I wanted to get the single cow burger, but it wasn't available in my region, but it, that is not something that I would personally go and pursue. Yeah. Well, you, you had, there was a, an, in the um, fire phone bit that you discussed another moment of being out of touch about calendaring. Right. Yeah. He said, he said, nobody uses their digital calendar. Right. And of course he has three or four assistants at the time. Um, and somebody had to gently say, no, people, people probably do use that. Yeah. But, but look, I mean, we're, we're having fun. Um, you know, the instincts, well, I'll, let's say this part of maybe some of the, the elixir there is trying 10 things and having two of them work really well. And one of his skills seems to be not, uh, well, to go back to the earlier conversation, not really being embarrassed um, and you know willing to kind of get get out there and take a risk in calling out the National Enquirer. And with respect to these these eight things that don't work, not being afraid to kind of fail really conspicuously. Sure. And there was an anecdote of him telling the person who ran the fire phone, "It's okay. Like, right. Not bad on you. It's all. It was you know not. That's right. It's okay to fail. Right. Yeah. Yeah." How about, there was another line I hadn't heard of before. That was kind of an interesting thing. The, um, I'm going to read it. it a, a, another new Jeffism, I guess. There are two ways of building a business. Many times you aim, 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 and then shoot, or you shoot, 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 and then aim a little bit. Right. How, how do you see both of those playing out? And then what does it mean for the teams on both, you know, people who work it and have to deal in both of these businesses? Yeah. And, and what does it mean for society, right? Because that might be describing one of the, one of the flaws of the big tech companies and the big tech CEOs. So the context for that quote is in India and Amazon has lost billions of dollars in China. And he, Bezos doesn't want to make, make the same mistakes in India. And he sends one of his, another one of his technical assistants, his, his chief of staffs uh, to India to build this business. And they come back and they present in Seattle a, a, a very conservative plan, or at least a set of, a set of options that Bezos thought was conservative. And he, he, he wanted them to you know, not sort of limit their opportunity to basically just build and invest and buy the TV ads and, and, and find the sellers and grow as fast as they could. And, and, and then he went to India and actually um, you know, delivered that quote to the team there. And this, you know, he's basically saying, like he, he said, he, he wants them to be, act like cowboys, you know, in the kind of wild west. And that was inspirational for that team. Uh, but what I mean by the kind of risks uh, and the consequences that are coming with big tech companies, I mean, I think one of the themes of this book is when you build large systems uh, like the Amazon marketplace and you grow them really quickly and you, you know, you aim, fire, 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 aim, you know, sometimes bad things happen, right? And with the marketplace, it was an onslaught of fraud and counterfeit and fake reviews and all the things, Karen, you guys at the Times have covered and we've covered at Bloomberg. And, and then they kind of turn around and say, well, wait a second, let's aim a little bit. And they create systems to combat the fraud. But in the meantime, you've got exploding hoverboards and, and everything else. So that, that example was in India. They've built a, uh, they, well, they grew a business quickly there. And then the political winds shifted with the Modi administration getting a little protectionist. And, and so far, I'd say the sort of jury is out there. Um, they built a big business. I don't imagine that it's profitable yet. Uh, but Bezos felt like he had lost China. He had to win in India. And that's a place where they continue to really uh, spend a lot of money. Well, it's related to China as well. You kind of track, you talked about the marketplace. And for the people listening who don't know, the majority of the products sold on Amazon are not products that Amazon buys and then sells to you. They're products that a vendor, a third-party seller lists on Amazon. So they basically give Amazon a cut of the sales. But it, when it was opened initially, it was kind of, not anyone could join, but almost anyone could join. It was join mostly it used created, booksellers. And then you, you kind of track how it kind of spiraled out of control. The growth was more important than any sense of quality. And there was you know, fake reviews and exploding hoverboards. There wasn't safety um, measures in place. And um, and it's, uh, oh my gosh, I lost my train of thought. Well, Sorry. let me say, let yeah. me just jump in and say, 
when Bezos was interviewing executives to run the marketplace, he was asking them, how would you get a million sellers onto this marketplace? And that is, tells you everything you need to know because the only answer to that is to create a self-service sign-up platform. And when you do that and you're lowering the friction and you're lowering the bar, of course, bad things are going to happen. You know, there, there was really no vetting. Um, they saw, you know, Amazon pitches itself as not a competition oriented company or competitor oriented company, but a customer oriented company. But they very much saw um, Alibaba and the potential for Alibaba to expand internationally. And they saw this little startup that some people may or may not know about called Wish, which was really doing a kind of arbitrage, taking uh, manufacturers in China, selling stuff abroad. And Bezos looked at his deputies and said, you guys are on this, right? And that was all they needed to hear. And they, they basically go to China and they set up systems and translate from Mandarin. And an onslaught of sellers come under the, under the self-service platform and what you described was the result, you know, a, a explosion of selection, low prices, but, you know, jeans where the zippers are going to fall off or shoes that will self-destruct uh, upon the third wear. And it's interesting because um, that's still an issue, even though Amazon has tried to kind of clean it up. And you wonder if at some point it begins to affect the reputation of the company. Marketplace has also caused a lot of political trouble and in DC, you kind of chart that that rise as well. And you, you, you looked into, for example, some of the issues around the, um, the private label business that has gotten Bezos personally, but the company broadly kind of under scrutiny. Right. So this is the big issue um, and it's come up in, in Congress and and I cover it in the book. Did, did the, well, let me step back. Okay, so every retailer, uh, your Walgreens, Walmart, Costco, you, you go in and there's the house brand. And that is a page in the retail playbook. Um, Kirkland at Costco is obviously an enormous part of their business. And as Amazon grew a consumables business, really the retail business, you know, they, they looked at that page and they said, well, we should have private labels. The margins are higher. It's, it offers selection and it offers a lower price. And the question has been, as they built out that business and managers in a very Amazon-like way were giving ex given extreme goals, did they look at the marketplace seller for example, the, the nutritional company that's selling uh, enzymes and where there are a ton of SKUs and that they look at what's selling and then go back and create that product for Amazon. And what I found in the book is that there, there was a period in time where the guardrails were not high enough and the pressure was on and the temptation was big and they looked. And it's funny that Amazon really doesn't admit that or won't or can't um, because Bezos has been asked that in Congress and they say they're investigating. And I don't know about you, Karen, I've never heard any kind of result from that. Um, and so, you know, that is interesting. And it's also something that's easy, I think, for regulators and lawmakers to kind of understand in this complex morass that is Amazon and, and it, you know, so opaque in the way it's it, it, its parts operate together. And that does seem, it doesn't smell right. And so it's something that maybe lawmakers have kind of clung on to. Definitely easy to, to wrap your head around. Absolutely. What well, also shows how many, you kind of chart Amazon playing in so many different places that they're developing so many constituencies. You know, it's not just customers, which they're so used to being singularly focused on. But in this case, they have these small businesses, these more not always small businesses selling on the marketplace that are in some sense, customers as well, paying them to, to list. Right. And they, right. they have to balance those demands in a way they hadn't historically been used to. One thing I did in the book is, um, you know, it's always so hard, and I'm sure you run into this in your reporting too. It's like you, you talk to a disgruntled seller or three or five, but does that really represent, you know, the, the, the lion's share of opinion or the overall sentiment? Like we don't know, and we don't have access to like a super poll. Um, and so I went back to all the sellers who were mentioned in Bezos' the shareholder letter over the last 10 years, uh, and a couple of sellers who had advocated for Amazon uh, in state capitals or in Washington. And I you know, called them up, uh, sometimes it was, it was after many years. Um, actually, uh, Bezos' investor letters had been accumulated together in, in this book, Invent and Wander, so it was really easy to go flip through. And, um, and their, their tune had changed. They had been the advocates for the marketplace. And many of them, 
pretty much all of them had, had grown somewhat embittered. And I think that reflects how quickly things change on the marketplace and how radically the field has tilted to sellers in regions that enjoy cost advantages. That's you know China and elsewhere where maybe the taxes aren't high or they're easily avoided or the government is financing or subsidizing new business growth or international shipments. And there's a previous generation of Amazon seller that I think is really upset at the way that the marketplace has developed. You know, the marketplace was kind of really exploding as what, at the same time as Prime is exploding, at the same time as the cloud services, AWS is exploding. There's this period around 2015 where it's like Amazon went from big to sort of everywhere. And we felt that in Seattle too. All, that's when you start seeing the headcount in the company broadly, but in the city really, really grow. And you started feeling the repercussions of that politically in, in the city um, very aggressively on kind of, it was just a straight up fight. I mean, I don't know how else to describe it. How did you, it was interesting living through it as a Seattle and I'm curious um, how you came to, with a little bit of hindsight, piece it together about what it meant for the city and what it meant for the company and having and just a prominent employer's role or purpose in the city as well. How did, right. how did and, and I didn't know how much time I would spend on that. And then what I came to realize was that the fight in Seattle over the head tax with the progressive members of the Seattle City Council was part and parcel of the HQ2 story. Um, and I, I, I don't think I had realized that at the time or from afar, but essentially, you know, Seattle is 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 thriving, but along with it are, are all the negative consequences of rapid growth, uh, gentrification, rising home prices, uh, homelessness. I've been living that in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we've had the same kind of tech clash. And um, you know, Amazon is such a prominent, you know, maybe the prominent member of corporate society in Seattle, and you have, you know, members of the city council really targeting it. And the feeling inside Amazon that things like the head tax proposal were, were unfair, that the city already paid a lot of taxes. Now, look, I mean, Amazon up to that point hadn't been a very philanthropic contributor to, to the community. And so some of the criticism I think was fair. On the other hand, I think that the city was really unprepared. Maybe how could they be prepared for the massive rapid growth uh, company that I remember visiting, um, you know, when it was on the hill with the, uh, the, uh, the veterans hospital and now employs 40, 45,000 people at the time uh, in downtown Seattle. So it was, it was an explosion of employees, all the negative impacts. And, you know, Amazon and Bezos, in fact, um, really took it personally. And, you know, I report in the book that he capped Amazon's growth at around 50,000 employees. He shut down two projects and Amazon sold one, one building. And basically the HQ2 process was underway, but they really intensified it. And that is one of the things that led them to kind of scrap Surprisingly so, the internal recommendations of the HQ2 team, they had selected in the end or nominated Philadelphia, Chicago, and, and Raleigh, and, and to go sort of fatefully with uh, New York City and uh, Crystal City in Virginia. That was another extremely public, um, I don't know what the word is, uh, it's not Bruja. brawl, Bruja, scandal, just drama. Drama, I guess. It was a lot of drama for a couple of years there. Yeah. I mean, how many articles did you write in the New York Times about HQ2? And I, I remember I wrote one about all the anticipation of it and how when um, Bezos appeared at a uh, club in Miami, everyone in the Miami press was like, does that mean that Miami's going to get HQ2? <laughs> right. No, it meant that uh, Bezos was enjoying himself. Exactly. Exactly. Right. His last um, was towards the end of his relationship with his with Mackenzie. Right. Um, the HQ2 process kind of coincided around the time of him becoming the world's wealthiest person. And as, as you write, that kind of as Amazon has told you, you know, that then ends up in every every story. And how do, does that make their Amazon? I mean, Amazon is a lot of people. I mean, your story is your book has a lot of Jeff in it, but it's a lot of other people, smart, ambitious, mostly men, um, does that make their job harder? 
Well, I mean, Bezos becoming the wealthiest person in the world. I mean, I think that's part and parcel with, of course, and, and a direct result of Amazon becoming one of the one of the most highly valued companies in the world, hitting a trillion dollar market cap, which happens around the HQ2 process. There is a psychological, I feel like, turning point there. And the HQ2 process was inspired, you know, I talked about the, the frictions in Seattle, but also by Bezos looking at the success Elon Musk was having with the Gigafactory in Nevada, um, Foxconn in Wisconsin, Boeing in the state of Washington, and thinking, you know, Amazon's a job creator. It should get a, a, a tax advantage in one of these locations. And I think what they underestimated was maybe the psychological turning point of that came with their growth and the fact that the political winds that seemed so, uh, so difficult but unique to Seattle were actually not a provincial thing. You know, they were not only happening in the Bay Area, but when they went to, to, to Queens, that storm was there too. It, it had a little bit of a different uh, flavor. I'm mixing metaphors wildly. You know, that was originally, you know, about gentrification and transportation. And then it was the helipads and, and Bezos asking, um, of course, let's say, let's state for the record, Amazon denies this. But, but Bezos is, is dating a helicopter pilot. He's taking helicopter lessons. He buys a helicopter. I found that in the personal records, uh, the public records of his personal company. And there's a public backlash against that. And then it crystallizes into the question in early 2019 of whether Amazon will support unions. And it's, these are really all the same issues, the anxiety about what these big tech companies are doing to our society, the income inequality, um, you know, the, 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 the wealth, the kind of unseemly wealth of, of the founders. Um, and, and right, they run headlong into the same st storm system that they're trying to escape. I'm just going to put a call out for questions. If people can submit questions, we're happy to get to them soon. Yes, the helipad. Someone pointed out to me that he was actually um, had a, a brush, a, a helicopter crash. And so right. it actually was not like, a, there's like helicopter guys apparently, and he's not. He so you not. found out he's a yacht guy. Well, okay. So I feel like there are two, these two somewhat maybe trivial things in the book that actually kind of chart his evolution. And one of them is the helicopter interest. He, he almost died in a helicopter accident in like 2000 or 2001 as he was scoping out land for his ranch in Texas. And now he is a helicopter pilot and an owner and, and has a partner who's a helicopter pilot. And then the other transformation is, you know, the Bezos that I started covering was not really, did not seem interested to me at least in the extravagances of, of wealth like a uh, yachting. And now of course he's photographed on the yacht of David Geffen and Barry Diller. And I discover in the book um, and, and which is now subsequently kind of out there that he is building this magnificent 400 foot three mass schooner, um, which uh, you know uh, unfortunately does not have room for a helipad. So there's a support yacht for the helipad um, and which is apparently supposed to be completed sometime later this year or early next year. So those two things I think, you know, it's, look, I mean, he's human and probably, uh, you know, his eyes opened up to a world beyond Amazon. What, you know, for a long time he was building the company and now um, he's clearly, you know, doing other things, not just uh, Amazon, but the philanthropy and Blue Origin, the space company and the Washington Post and enjoying himself, it does seem a little bit uh, with uh, the yacht and other luxuries. What do you think about, you know, he, he, um you know, stepping aside as CEO later this year, um, he has, there's a kind of a, a generation of, of people that are not only running Amazon now, but are running companies all over the country, you know, tech companies all over the country. I mean, there's constant, you know, many, many, many startups are established tech companies now. What is, like, what is the Amazon culture or the legacy of that? And do you think it will change or um, is, or is this kind of tweaks around the edges situation? Right. So, so does Andy Jassy come in as CEO and change the Amazon culture? Well, look, I mean, the culture, you know, let's posit that it's been effective, right? They've built a $1.6 trillion company, but as the New York Times has sort of famously covered, and what I covered in my first book, 
it's it can be a mean culture, right? And I have a I have a a story in this book of Bezos analyzing a six page document, finding a mistake, tearing the document in half, and throwing it down the table and walking out. Right? The standards are high. People work around the clock. Um, I think subsequent to the New York Times article in 2015, they kind of softened the edges, but Bezos never wanted it to be a country club. And as a result, I think some sort of meanness, um, they wouldn't use those words, uh, but I will, you know, kind of went into the corporate culture. And the thing about Andy Jassy is I, I think there's a little bit more of the, of the, the, the sort of empathy gene that maybe Bezos lacks a little bit. He certainly, I think, has a greater awareness for the needs of, of diver diversity in leadership. Um, you know, all that said, he's run a pretty tight shop at AWS, and, and that can that's a high performance culture too. But I do think that Jassy will try to try to inject maybe a little a little uh, layer of friendliness um, uh, in, into that culture that has been so notoriously lacking it uh, over the course of Amazon history. Yeah, there, there are little vignettes that speak to it in your book. You know, so-and-so's first weeks on the project was when he was on vacation on this island or, and then there's all these, you know, there's a lot of men in the book and it's this man tell this alpha man to do this alpha man to do this. And then you have right. some women and not all of them leave, but many do. Help well, and, and right there, I, I do feel like that is a theme in the book where there, there are um, a, a number of, of women in the book who made important contributions at Amazon. And at least some of them express a little bit of wistfulness about, um, you know, did they did they did they contribute more than they they got from Amazon? Why wasn't there better representation on the senior leadership team? You know, I have a a, a, an, a person in the book who who basically ran the first Prime Day, and you know her her name is Megan, and and she talked for the book about how kind of con terribly conflicted she was about working at Amazon and whether you know Bezos really had deserved her trust and her efforts and what Prime Day meant. Um, you know, were they just signing people up to buy things that perhaps they didn't need? And, you know, that's obviously there's a range of opinion at Amazon, but it was really sort of meaningful to me and, and sort of moving how she leaves the company. She goes to Zillow and she, th she cancels her Prime account and she recycles her Echoes and she's like done. And part of it was because she felt like as a female inside Amazon, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't supported. And that it was a very male, not just a male dominated culture, but like a male culture, like a lot of those leadership principles, a lot of the ways that meetings were conducted and promotions were evaluated were in some ways male oriented. I'm going to do a couple of the questions. Um, one of them I feel like kind of related to buying. Someone wanted to know how you feel about the fact that most of your books will probably be purchased on Amazon or listened to on Audible. Yes, there is a, a fundamental awkwardness to to uh, this part of my authorial career because it is predominantly they you know they are predominantly bought on, on Amazon, um, not not totally, um, and so I'm writing about. Yeah, the company that's selling the book, um, it's it's sort of not healthy. As as like your typical author, I'm um, I'm completely absorbed and obsessed by the the rank the sales ranking, which is like a drug. And I thought I was off the drug, and now unfortunately I'm back on it. In fact, I'm sort of tempted to to tell you guys to hang on so I could check what it is. Um, but I guess the answer is I feel conflicted. Um, and, and it's one reason why I started my book tour um, at, at Book Passage in in, uh, in Corte Madera, um, you know. And 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 I tell people like, you know, look, it's uh, if you, if you want to see the local the great local bookstores, you know, thrive, then um, you you know you have to you have to support them. And um, you know, and 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 I think you know that's unfortunately true, and it's particularly true after COVID nineteen. You know, these are these small stores are an endangered species, and if you want the variety, uh, you know, and the intellectual energy that they bring to your community, you have to support them. So another question: Was there ever a company that held as much of the public attention as Amazon before? And then, what do you think that influence means for the future of society? It's so difficult to imagine a world without Amazon. So let me understand the question: Has there ever been a company that has commanded so much influence? Uh, commanded attention, so much attention. Well, attention. Well, I mean, you know, before, 
before Amazon, you know, we, we, we wrung our hands for a good decade about Walmart. Right. And, um, and, and before that, you know, it was, it was Sears and before that, um, you know, the great AMP. Um, so I do think that there, there is something about a retailer and Bezos himself had identified this in, in one of the memos that's actually published in the everything store, you know, that there's something about a retailer, a big retailer that's fundamentally in competition with your sympathetic smaller stores uh, that's going to cast them a little bit as, as the villain in the public eye. And he thought the antidote was to keep being seen as an inventor. And it's why, you know, he likes to be called an inventor and he, you know, has invested heavily in Alexa and the, and the Amazon Go store. Um, but it, it was interesting um, and somewhat deserved that during COVID-19, during the pandemic, I'm talking about it as if it's the past tense and perhaps that's hopeful, um, but Amazon's workplace conditions, uh, you know, Amazon safety precautions, they really were the focus of attention in the way that perhaps, you know, Walmart was not. And, and look, you know, Amazon continued to operate. A lot of stores had to close for the, for the key months of early in the pandemic. And, and just to, you know, jump ahead really quickly, I have a chapter on, in the book on the pandemic. And I think there are good reasons to, to criticize Amazon. You know, the, the early months, I think, you know, there was a lot of confusion. They tried to instill some safety precautions, but, you know, I have plenty of testimony from workers about how, you know, they, they weren't confident. They felt like some of, the, some of the precautions were piecemeal. And then I really think Amazon kind of got its act together and invested. And then the second thing, and the really deplorable thing, and I know, Karen, you covered this at the Times, is how there were sort of whistleblowers or you know employees who were bringing their safety concerns making them public and amazon fired them and it just it's one of those things that you know it doesn't it doesn't smell right it feels like the company is sort of intolerable uh, doesn't tolerate internal dissent maybe fears uh, you know the repercussions of a of an activist workforce um, that's a long way of saying of answering the question and and saying that Amazon is not unique in commanding so much attention, but it certainly has inherited the mantle uh, these days. Maybe, uh, maybe Facebook being a, a primary contender of the company that we seem, not just we in the media, but, but politicians and maybe part of the public too seem to obsess over quite a bit. Hey, you know, the, the response to that internal criticism is that you, you chart different moments where there's kind of acceptance of critique and then moments where there's not. Right. <laughs> and it, it, sometimes it's hard to understand why one fall, something falls one way. Did you find a rhyme or a reason? Well, sometimes, you know, Bernie Sanders critiques their wages and eventually they raise the wages. They raise them, right. But then there's other times where it's, you know, aggression, aggression. How, how do you find how they make that decision? Or I mean, some, some of them you charted went straight to Jeff. Right. I, I, I think that... Um the radioactive um, trigger is, is unions. I think when it comes to the labor movement, and this is what we saw recently in Bessemer, where they lashed out publicly at critics over the union vote. And you know, some, of the, some of the employees that they did dismiss during the pandemic were agitating you know, for union representation. Maybe they had union histories. Um, you know, the, the employees who ran at the Amazon Employees for Climate Justice, um, they, well, Karen, you'll remind me if I'm wrong, but they weren't dismissed. Um, they had been, they had organized a climate strike and what ultimately uh, got them fired, if I recall, was organizing a, a, a group talk about safety issues in the fulfillment centers. Yeah, that was the, the timing. Amazon contests this and this is being, you know, litigated with the NLRB, but it came right as they were trying to build bridges to the right. fulfillment center workforce. I just think yeah. when I, that, and, and look, I report in the book, um, you know, that Bezos early on thought that one of the biggest challenges to Amazon was an entrenched and disgruntled workforce, the kind of workforce that had organized at the automakers that, that he felt, you know, limited their flexibility, their versatility, their ability to innovate. And because Amazon, unlike most big technology companies, it was going to have this large workforce in the fulfillment centers, a blue collar workforce. It's now probably about a million people, you know, that that was a sort of unique danger to the company. And they've encoded some really subtle things into the employment agreements. You know, three, you go three years in an Amazon fulfillment center, 
And if you're not promoted, you, you no longer see any raises. The company is sort of subtly telling you in a number of ways that it's time to move on. They'll pay you to quit. That's another little uh, program they have. Um, he doesn't want people sticking around where maybe they do become susceptible to union organizing. And so I do think to go back to the original question, is there a rhyme or reason for when they seem to fly off their Twitter handle uh, and, and, get, and, and get acrimonious or combative? And I do feel like when it comes to that issue, there's, there's just no compromise. And you saw an Amazon executive in, in Queens when he testified in February of 2019, and they tried to ask him, you know, would Amazon ever consider uh, supporting a union in the New York area? And he kind of, he, he made a mistake because he was really explicit in his answer and honest. He said, no. And then of course he had de Blasio saying, well, you know, New York's a union town, get over it. You know, if you want to come here, you have to unionize. And Amazon pulled out. They, the, like the next week they left, they took their toys and left. So I think that's the answer to your question that on this one issue, they seem to really be fierce in their unwillingness to kind of have a discussion. Someone asked, what did you make about why the union vote in Alabama failed? Right. Well, I mean, I, I think like we can, you know, the well, let's say the union can point to the structural advantages that companies have, you know, in talking to their employees in the fulfillment centers, um, you know, in 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 these little things, um, you know, putting the mailboxes out front. Um, you know, the fact is that union membership has decl been declining probably for as long as I've been alive. Um, you know, this is the 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 deep south where you know. The, the union passed as checkered. They, they lost their factories, you know, first to the north and then overseas. Uh, the unions didn't help with that. But I think that, you know, the main issue is this was, a, it was a poorly selected target. It was a one year old fulfillment center. And to go back to, to my previous, you know, statement or point, you know, the, the, the greatest target for a union is going to be that entrenched workforce, that long-term workforce that's familiar with management, tensions have been created, there's a lot of bad history, and then they organize. And this is, you know, this is a year old facility in the deep South. And so, you know, they had a lot of, the union did have a lot of advantages. You had the president of the United States uh, weighing in, you had Bernie Sanders uh, making a visit, but I just think the fundamental, like the soil wasn't fertile enough and those workers were new. I'm sure they value their jobs, the $15 an hour wage, uh, the healthcare, and it was ripe for really what was, I think, a humiliation of the union, you know, by Amazon and its employees. I was struck that overall the um, turnout in the vote was very low broadly. It wasn't a ringing endorsement of Amazon, as much as they won, essentially. Yeah, or ambivalent. The, the fact is that the conversation that the union was having and that perhaps we in the media were having was not one that the workers were having um, or, or at least wanted to have. Um, I, yeah, I don't know if it was a ringing endorsement of Amazon, but I, I think it's fair to interpret it as a little bit of a repudiation of, of that particular union. Yeah, Absolutely. they weren't interested. They didn't see what the you know, what, what benefits the union would bring to them. Absolutely. Yeah. And they, they miss, they overestimated their own support. It seemed like. No doubt. Um, a, another question was about how much of the brain space that Jeff Bezos and Amazon take up in our minds and the culture is a voyeurism of just this extreme wealth that we're so enthralled with. And do we enable it or, allow it just because we're so fixated and enamored with it? Like what's our role? No, I reject that. I think, and you know, I'll defend my, you know, two books here. Um, no, this is the most powerful company almost in the world and an extraordinary market cap, the third or fourth largest now in the world, the wealthiest person in the world, um, a, a company that exerts enormous influence uh, on Washington DC and in Brussels, a company with a history of not, I won't, I won't say, tax avoidance, but certainly, you know, clever tax minimization um, that, that is as a history of leveraging its, its strengths in one industry into another. Um, and, and, and a company that touches my readers and, Karen, and your readers, Karen, and people are, are completely interested in. And so, no, I don't think it's sort of voyeurism of any kind. We're trying to hold power to account and, and, and investigate and probe a company that 
you know, has kind of transformed society, right? Changed the way we shop, helped to change the character of communities, changed the way we talk to computers or we operate computers, changed the way we watch TV and movies. You know, the, the impact has been extraordinary. And it's, I think it's just demands, probably demands more coverage and attention than it gets. Well, I it gets a lot of attention. I think Karen and I would both agree that there should be more journalists covering Amazon. We're like a little fraternity of, of like desperate, you know, scribes trying to trying to get inside the 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 empire and figure out what's going on. This um, second half of one of the questions earlier was about what is what does their influence mean for the future of society? It's difficult to imagine the world without Amazon. Well. Um, I, you know, I, I think I, I think hopefully I explore some of these issues in, in Amazon Unbound. Um, I, I think we're, you know, we're in danger of, you know, wealth and power consolidating. There, there is really nothing in the machinery that I'm chronicling in this book, you know, that suggests that it will be slowing down if Bezos steps aside for good or not. Like they have such an entrenched advantage. Um, Fulfillment centers are moving outside of more towns. Um, distribution centers and drivers, they're building data centers. They're, they're borrowing money just last week to build new facilities. And that will engender another wave of faster delivery um, and lower prices and, and, and cheaper, cheaper prices for web services. And so it's almost like a boulder running downhill and I can't say what it means for society, but you know, we you know, in the book I, I talk about the nurturing son of like fair competition. And as a society, I think we want competition and we want alternatives. And I think the company that and the juggernaut and I, I call it the, the the global empire in the book that I described is something that we as a society kind of have to understand and contend with, because you know otherwise. Um, you know, they'll, they'll, there will be an imp more of an impact, I think, on our local communities and our economy. Towards the end of the book, the, at, the, at the end of the book, you would say, you know, is Amazon, I forget the exact question, but was it like, are we better off with Amazon? And you kind of say, well, what do you say? Well, I oh. punt. You punt, okay, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. <laughs> yes, I, I do. Why did you punt? Why did you feel comfortable spending, you know, three years, four years right. and then punting? Well, I, I feel like it's an unanswerable question. And, and the interesting thing is that Bezos in his last investor letter, I think does try to answer that question. And obviously he's making a case in that investor letter that Amazon contributes more than it, it extracts. And he goes through a mathematical calculation that includes uh, shareholder value and compensation and web service, uh, you know, uh, economic activity and marketplace activity. And, you know, he's defending his legacy. Well, you know, I felt like there's so much that's unknowable, you know, the cost of uh, unfair competition where it exists, uh, the damage to local business, um, you know, et, et cetera. And, you know, and also at the same time, you know, I'll just say that I'm an Amazon customer, right? I'm a Prime member and I'm an Alexa owner. And I, I know in my own life, it's been beneficial. Like I feel like it restores time, you know, to me when I order something online. But I, I think that it's economic impact, you know, barring some uh, brilliant academic who comes and really tallies it, it's sort of unknowable. And as the company gets bigger, um, and begins to leverage some of its advantages to expand even even further, then then maybe the the the, the ledger starts to move in the you know at least uh, you know further toward the negative side, uh, and that's why I think I just think lawmakers and regulators you know who seem to have a sometimes a tenuous understanding of Amazon and how it operates and look deliberately so like the company is really opaque. Um, in its financial statements and in the way it wants the world to understand it, which is one of the reasons why I wrote this book. Um, uh, you know, and, and I think that hopefully people can kind of get a better, well, regulators and lawmakers and maybe customers can read the book and get a better understanding of, of sort of how it works and where, you know, there are maybe kind of corporate anti-competitive injustices that need to be addressed. Do you, so you now have two books on Amazon. You've spent a decade of your life on it? Something well, I did have a book in between. In between. <laughs> right. right, right. Is there a, a three cool? I don't know if that's a word, but- That is a um, word. Yeah, okay. Is a word. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, both for Amazon and for Jeff, because right. he's young. 
and has money and ambition and the company is, you know, as you said, the boulders rolling downhill. Right. Do you, what is, what is next? I mean, this is, you know, things seem to, big things seem to pop out of virtually nowhere. Um, just, uh, like Alexa, for example, right. you know, or the ghost story you chronicle, things like that. They're like, where right. <laughs> right. this has been going on for seven years or something. Right. Do you have your, what's your magic ball? Well, okay. In terms of like a third book, um, I, I never anticipated writing a second book until I, I, I looked and I, I thought the story had become, you know, so good uh, that it really deserved its own chronicle. And then as I was working on it, it got better and better as we've, as we've talked about. And so now, you know, he has stepped aside as CEO. Um, he will begin, I think, a gradual drift from the company. He'll see, he's still going to be involved as an executive chairman, but he's got his philanthropy. Um, he's got the yacht and Blue Origin, the space company, desperately needs, I think, some personal attention from him because they are fail they are falling much farther behind, I think, Elon Musk and SpaceX that Jeff is probably comfortable with. Um, but I, I suppose in 10 years um, after, you know, I've sort of have the amnesia about how difficult this book was. If I, if I look at the decade and I go, this is an amazing story. Um, you know, this is a new chapter and the history needs to be updated. You know, then I can see, yeah, I could see it. And, and Amazon is exploring some interesting things. We've reported it at Bloomberg that they, they have a robot project that kind of you know, a little R2-D2 that they, they think might follow you around in your home, probably with Alexa. There, they, there's a plan to launch satellites and offer internet access. Um, one of the most ambitious projects in the company is to disrupt healthcare. Uh, they call it the Grand Challenge and they're, um, they're, they're opening clinics. Uh, they have an online pharmacy. There's a, a telehealth service and they're working on devices to support that. And so if the $1.6 trillion company is like a $5 trillion company and, you know, I'm still around and um, Bezos himself is maybe who, like optimistically, maybe we could hope that he he's had an impact on climate change. Then I think, you know, that, that would be an interesting story. Another question came in um, about kind of, does Amazon have, as Amazon gets big, do they have responsibility to solve big problems. Um, an example here was homelessness or, and, and, and what, what do you think? And then also, what do they think? And then, or are they just a company and that's too much to ex expect of? Obviously homelessness being one of the, the biggest issues in this city is facing right now. Right. At many cities, but this in particular. I think a couple of years ago, they didn't think they did have a responsibility. And, and then uh, particularly for homelessness and then, and then the real estate chief, John Schottler, um, he, he, you know, he led that, was it a days in the, the homeless shelter that's now in Amazon's headquarters. And, you know, I felt, I felt in looking at it, like maybe this stuff was really off Bezos's radar. And then you fast forward to 2019 and Amazon employees are starting to, to voice concerns about Amazon's climate impact because it has cars on the road and data centers that, you know, use electricity and probably natural gas. And, you know, they were rightfully concerned, of course, packaging and Bezos, who on some of these issues, I think, uh, you know, is, is leading less and maybe reading and observing the criticism more, um, you know, announced the climate pledge, which was very Bezos-like. He's not going to just release a carbon impact report. He's got to do something new and label it. Um, and that is a little bit of an awakening for Amazon that, that, you know, they're so big that they need to lead on social issues and make a contribution. You know, if they want, and I, I call this in the book, this chapter in the book, License to Operate, you know, if they want that social license to operate in our communities in Seattle, then they need to be an active public, pub, uh, public citizen. And I think for too long, Bezos was sort of absorbed in the mechanics of Amazon's growth and sort of realized too late, you know, to answer the excellent question that that was not going to be enough. And they had to try to solve some of the problems that maybe indirectly they had caused or at least contributed to. And so hopefully we're starting to see a more socially conscientious sorry, socially conscious Amazon, that's probably only relative to their earlier indifference. There's still a, a long way to go in, in Seattle and elsewhere. So we are at an hour. I'll ask you the last question I ask most interviewees. Any okay. question I should have asked you that I didn't? <laughs> well, Karen, we, we covered um, 
we covered the ground. I feel like, well, we're both Amazon scribes. So I don't know, maybe is there one question we can both take a crack at? Um, okay, how about this? I'll go first and then I'm curious what you think. Does, does Jeff Bezos really let Andy Jassy run the company? Okay, because I think that is like the question. And I, I think that like, or I think it'll be a process and that um, maybe, you know, he's still the loudest voice in the conference room for the next year or so. Um, he, you know, it's, it's, he, he's too much of a sort of micromanager. Um, this is his baby. Um, I, I think the process is going to be maybe slower and more difficult than they expect at Amazon. And I, I sort of suspect on the big decisions, he'll still be a pretty loud voice. What do, what do you think? I've been struck, I think before I started covering the company, I assumed he was intricately involved with everything. And I've been struck at how much he doesn't touch anymore. Right. Um, I had heard, and you also had in the book that like he marketplace, which was, you know, 60% of sales on the website, he hadn't done an annual review for in right. years and it caused a lot of problems. So I right. think that, that the degree to which he was hands off huge chunks of the business means a lot of it. I don't, you know, is operating without him now, you know, right. operations world is Dave Clark runs. That's you know, there's, true. There's, Changed yeah, there's a big bit chunks of the company yeah. that he's not, his hands aren't on. I don't know what it means for the pieces where they're like, really, you right. know, the grand challenges of the, of the company and things. That's like right. That. And he says he's still going to do that. And, and we will, we will see. Well, Karen, thank you so much. This When's the really yacht fun. ready? I guess that's the real question. When's when the yacht the ready? That's the deadline. Be, will, do you think we'll be invited to the opening of the yacht? I think we'll be on the helipad next next to it. Oh, wait, I have a really good question to end on. If if Blue Origin was going to send you an invitation to go up in New Shepherd, <laughs> would you would you go? I have a four year old. <laughs> okay. I would not. Would you? No, I, I'd be way too scared. Probably not. I'd be way too scared. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Thanks, Brad. Thank you both so much. Uh, it's so interesting and hear you talk about uh, being insiders who you talk about this company that just kind of, especially here in Seattle, I was thinking as you were speaking that there's, my sense is that there's this camp that is, they work for Amazon and they get all the things and they benefit from it. And then there's this other group of people that are just like, why is it here? We hate it, you know? So such a relevant topic to all of us in the city. So thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank the audience as well. Thanks for watching. Um, I wanna encourage you to purchase a copy of Brad's book from Third Place Books. The link for that is in the chat. Um, it'll take you right over there and you, you can help support, uh, support them tonight. Um, Next time, I hope that we can host you both uh, live in the building. We'd love to have you back. Um, but until then, please stay safe um, and have a great night.